five, four, three, two, one, and we are off again. We're having a Savile week. We've got my dad coming on tonight at for the Savile reaction because it was actually episode two of the reckoning that my dad is in. So my dad is going to be coming on at ten tonight after the episode two airs on the BBC to do our reaction. We had Das on yesterday, Dr. Das, and we're going to have Ron Swanson, episode three, and Das is back for episode four. So many people in the chat last night were asking more about questions about the specifics of Savile's life and how he, what it was like for him growing up, his family, his relationship with his mum. So in this episode, we are going to go over Jimmy Savile's life slowly from birth until his death in his 80s. And we've got Wedger coming on with the intelligence agency side. We've got Christian Walmer coming on with the kids from the co-home side. We've got loads more podcasts coming out with Savile material in the next week. All right, let's go over to his early life then. And a huge thank you to everyone in the chat. Good evening, everyone. I'm sure many of you have seen that Holly Willoughby is no longer at this morning. Might have to put some out about that as well. All right. So, many of you know that Jimmy Savile was from Leeds. If you're watching in America, Leeds is a northern town. I'm from a northern town, Widnes. And I first heard of Leeds because it was a rugby league town. Rugby league, very popular in these northern towns. Leeds, Warrington, Widnes. So Savile was born at Consort Terrace in the Burley area of Leeds, West Riding of Yorkshire. He was the youngest of seven children, with his elder siblings were Murray, Marjorie, Vincent, John, Joan and Christina in a Roman Catholic family. And if you watch in The Reckoning, you will see how he uses his Roman Catholicism when he is called into question about his behavior with underage girls. So his parents were Vincent Joseph Marie Saville, who was a bookmaker's clerk and insurance agent, and his wife, Agnes Monica Kelly. So in the reckoning, you see this relationship with Agnes, whereby he is craving love and attention and he's not getting it and it's giving the impression that one of the, his drives to be successful is to impress his mum so his paternal grandmother was scottish so he grew up in the great depression we're going back now to the 1920s let's see when he was born yeah he was born Halloween 1926. So there was a massive Great Depression. The stock market crashed, lost a lot of its value. And he said, quote, I was forged in the crucible of want. He described his father as scrupulously honest, but scrupulously broke. His mother believed Savile owed his life to the intercession of Margaret Sinclair, a Scottish nun, after Savile recovered quickly from an illness, possibly pneumonia, at the age of two when his mother prayed at Leeds Cathedral after picking up a pamphlet about Sinclair. So he was sick for a very long time and he was his eyes uh, were open and they actually thought he was going to die. So Savile's mum praying and then this fast recovery which they put down to the praying made them label Savile the miracle child in his family. He then went to St. Anne's Roman Catholic School in Leeds. After leaving school at the age of 14, his first job was actually in an office, but at the age of 18 during the Second World War, he was conscripted to work as a Bevin boy. If you're not familiar with Bevin boys, I wasn't. I had to research this and look this up. But a Bevin boy works in the coal mines. 
They send them down there. It's dark. It's dangerous. And Saville reportedly suffered spinal injuries from a shot firer's explosion. This is in the mines. And he spent a long period recuperating, wearing a steel corset, and for three years walking with the aid of sticks. Following his work in the colliery, Jimmy became a scrap metal dealer. And then it was the early 1940s, so if he was born Halloween 26, um, by the early 1940s, he is almost 20, and he started playing records in dance halls. He claimed in his autobiography to be the first DJ. He was the first, he claimed to be the first to use two turntables and a microphone at the Grand Records Ball at the Guard Bridge Hotel in 1947. So he was 21 by then. Although this claim has been proven to be untrue because two turntables were illustrated in the BBC handbook in 1929 and advertised for sale in Gramophone magazine in 1931. But obviously he was a pioneer of using this technique in the dance halls. He became a semi-professional sportsman competing in the 1951 Tour of Britain cycle race and then working as a professional wrestler. He said, if you look at the athletics of it, I've done over 300 professional bike races, 212 marathons, and 107 professional fights. He proudly announced that he lost all of his first 35 fights. No wrestler wanted to go back home and say a long-heard disc jockey had put him down. So from start to finish, I got a good hiding. I've broken every bone in my body, but I loved it. He lived in Salford from the mid-1950s to the mid-1960s. So Salford is just west of Manchester. When I was a raver, I had raver friends in Salford. And when I came back to America, it was built up rather nicely with the Lowry Art Museum and all kinds of buildings on the waterfront. And I believe the BBC moved some of the facilities there. All right, so to the mid-1960s, the later period with Ray Tourette, who became his support DJ, assistant and chauffeur. Now, people were asking if the character in The Reckoning, his sidekick, was a dramatization or it was legit. And my dad came in the chat last night and he said, yeah, Ray Tourette ended up in prison for the R word. And he, he is a true character. And he, he did become Savile's assistant and chauffeur. So Savile managed the Plaza Ballroom on Oxford Street in Manchester City Centre in the mid-1950s. When he lived in Great Close Street in Higher Broughton, Salford, he was often seen sitting on his front doorsteps. He managed the Mecca Locarno Ballroom in Leeds in the late 1950s and early 1960s, as well as the Mecca-owned Palais Dance Hall in Ilford, Essex, between 1955 and 1956. His Monday evening records-only dance sessions admission one shilling, were popular with local teens. It was while at Ilford that Savile was discovered by a music executive from Decca Records. So if he's born in 26 and he's managing these dance halls for teens, and this is the 50s now and the 60s, so he's moved on to being 30 to 40, in his 30s and 40s, yet he is the guy all these teenagers are looking up to, and he takes advantage of that, which is really creepy. All right, so going into his radio career, his radio career began as a DJ at Radio Luxembourg from 1958 to 1968, and by 68, he presented six programs a week, and his Saturday show reached six million listeners. Can you imagine back then, you got 6 million listeners, how, you know, we talk about views on YouTube and things like that, virality. He was 
at the top of that kind of occupation. In terms of recognition, he was one of the leading DJs in Britain by the early 1960s. In 1968, he joined Radio 1, where he presented Savile's Travels, which is featured in episode 2 of The Reckoning, a weekly programme broadcast on Sundays in which he travelled along the UK talking to members of the public. From 1969 to 73, he fronted Speak Easy, a discussion programme for teenagers. On Radio 1, he presented the Sunday lunchtime show, Jimmy Savile's Old Record Club, playing chart top tens from years gone by. And it was the first show to feature old charts, and Savile used a point system in an imaginary quiz with the audience to guess the names of the song and artist. It began in 1973 as the double top ten show. Um, thanks for the super chat, Blood. And ended in 1987 as the triple top ten show when he left Radio 1 after 19 years. He presented the vintage chart show playing top tens from 1957 to 1987 on the BBC World Service from March 1987 until October 1989. From 89 to August 1997, he broadcast on various stations around the UK, mostly taking the gold format, such as the West Midlands Extra AM and the Classic Gold Network in Yorkshire, where he revived his Radio 1 shows. In 1994, satirist Chris Morris gave a fake obituary on BBC Radio 1 saying that Savile had collapsed and died, which allegedly drew threats of legal action from Savile and forced an apology from Morris. On the 25th of December 2005 and 1st of January 2007, he presented shows... Oh, thanks for the super chat, uh, Blood, another one. Cheers. Chad Marks uh, did 18 years. Yeah, have him email me. Um, on 25th of December, um, two, and 1st of January, he presented shows on Re Real Radio Network. The Christmas 2005 show counted down the festive top 10s, 10, 20, 30 years previously. While the New Year 2007 show, also taken by Century Radio, following its acquisition by GMG, featured Savile, recounting anecdotes from his past and playing associated records mostly from the 1960s and some from the 1970s so absolute phenomenal career in radio but that wasn't the only string in his bow thank you legal minds super chat appreciated all right so television look at how much he accomplished in television and this is where i found out about him when i was watching well when I, jim will fix it came into prominence. I didn't like it. I watched it a couple of times. But it didn't really appeal to me. All right, so his first television role was as a presenter of Tyne TV's television music program, Young at Heart, which aired from May 1960. Although the show was broadcast in black and white, he dyed his hair a different colour every week. On New Year's Day 1964, Savile presented the first edition of the BBC Music Chart television programme, Top of the Pops. Now, Top of the Pops, when I was a kid, we absolutely lived for it. Me and my sister, you know, I was into the dance music stuff when the raving scene was beginning. My sister was into more like the indie stuff. My dad loves Morrissey, still does love Morrissey to this day. And we would all just sit around. It was probably the TV show we all sat around the most, just glued waiting to see who they would showcase and the first edition of top of the pops from dickinson road studios a tv studio in a converted church in rush home manchester so on 30th of july 2006 he co-hosted the final weekly edition of top of the pops ending it with the words it's number one. Cheers for the super chat. It's number one. It's still top of the pops before turning off the studio lights after the closing credits. When interviewed by the BBC on 20th of November 2008 and asked about the revival of Top of the Pops for a Christmas comeback, he said he would welcome a cameo role in the programme. 
Now, in the early 1960s, he co-hosted with Pete Murray the televised New Musical Express Pole Winners Concert held annually at the Empire Pool in Wembley with acts such as the Beatles, Cliff Richards and the Shadows, Joe Brown and the Brothers, The Who and many others. And you see in the reckoning how, you know, when he is trying to get employment or trying to get a promotion, how we can just say, yeah, you know, he can, he can sit down with the Kinks. He's helping launch the Beatles. You know, he's basically got all of these contacts that the kids are most into at that time. And he has influence over the Beatles, the Kinks, and all these other people, so he claimed. All right, so on 31st of December 1969, he hosted the BBC ZDF co-production, Pop Go the 60s show across West Europe, celebrating the hits of the decade. He presented a series of public information films promoting road, road safety. You know, when I was in school, it was this catchphrase, clunk, click, every trip. And they got him to kind of lead this campaign. Um, you know, the campaign was a healthy campaign. It was promoting the use of seatbelts, of course. But he just managed to get in absolutely everywhere. He was omnipresent in all media, like something I've never seen anyone else achieve. And this was when technology was minimal compared to how it is now. So the clunk represented the sound of the door and the click, the sound of the seatbelt fastening. This was a government contract that he got. It led to Savile's Saturday Night Chat variety show from 1973 on BBC One titled Clunk Click which in 1974 featured the UK heats of the Eurovision Song Contest featuring Olivia Newton-John. After two series, Clunk Click was replaced by Jim will Fix It, which he presented from 1975 to 1994. So kids from all over the country were writing to Jimmy, can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Can you arrange this? Can I meet this person? And he even roped in senior members of the royal family to make these kids' dreams come true. Savile won an award from the Murray White House's National Viewers. Now, Murray White House was known as someone who was prim and proper and she would call out people for wrong behaviour. Yet, she was a good friend of Savile. Savile quotes Murray Whitehouse again when he's called to account by his superiors at the BBC. So he won an award from Murray Whitehouse's National Viewers and Listeners Association in 1977 for his wholesome family entertainment. He fronted a long-running series of advertisements in the early 1980s for British Rail's Inner City 125 in which he declared, this is the age of the train. He was twice the subject of the Thames TV series, This Is Your Life. And you can catch some of that on YouTube. And it's fascinating listening to him getting interviewed and the clues that he gives and how brazen he is. And that was with Eamon Andrews in 1970. And again in December 1990 with Michael Aspel. In an interview by Anthony Clare, for the radio series in the Psychiatrist Church in 91, Savile appears to be a man without feelings. There is something chilling about this 20th century saint, Clare concluded in 1992, in his intro to the published transcript of the interview. Andrew Neal interviewed Savile for the TV series in This Is Your Life in 1995, where Savile used the banana to avoid discussing his personal life. Now, this is something I discussed with John Wedger the other day, and we're hoping to get that podcast out within the week. So basically, Savile had the foresight to go on a TV show with a banana in his pocket, knowing that if he was called to account by the interviewer, he could whip this prop out and just get the audience giggling and completely change the dynamic and this is how he, he, he demonstrated how in control of a situation he could be to prevent it from going wrong. It's really sinister, really creepy. The behavioural panel, friends of the channel, 
uh, they have done an analysis on Savile and they zoom in on the banana scene and it's compulsively watchable all right so in 1999 Savile appeared as a panelist on have I got news for you in April 2000 many of us saw this it's hard to watch it now to find it anywhere to watch it I think the, the Beeb have scrubbed it Savile was the subject of a documentary by Louis Thoreau in the When Louis Met series in which Thoreau accompanied British celebs going about daily business, interviewing them about their lives and experiences. In this episode, Savile confided that he used to beat people up and lock them in a basement during his career as a nightclub manager when Louis challenged Savile about rumours of attraction to kids. Over a decade before, Savile said, We live in a very funny world and it's easier for me as a single man to say I don't like children because that puts a lot of salacious tabloid people off the hunt. Wow. Savile visited the Celebrity Big Brother house on 14th and 15th of January 2006 in Series 4 and fixed it for some housemates to have their wishes granted. Pete Burns received a message from his boyfriend Michael and Lynn, his ex-wife, while Dennis Rodman traded Savile's offering for a supply of cigarettes for the other housemates. In 2007, Savile returned to TV with Jim, Jim will Fix It Strikes Again, showing some of the most popular fix-its, recreating them with the same people, and making some new dreams come true. So he took over radio, he took over TV, but that wasn't it. He also took over charity fundraising, and this really gave him a shield. He's estimated to have raised £40 million for charity, which at today's currency is almost $50 million. One cause for which he raised money was Stoke Mandeville Hospital, where he volunteered for many years as a porter. He raised money for the Spinal Unit and St. Francis Ward, a ward for children and teenagers with spinal cord injuries. Remember at the beginning... When he was a Bevan boy in the mines, he himself sustained a spinal injury. He volunteered at Leeds General Infirmary and Broadmoor Hospital. In August 1988, he was appointed by Junior Health Minister Edwina Curry, chair of an interim task force overseeing the management of Broadmoor Hospital after its board members had been suspended. He had his own rooms at both Stoke Mandeville and Broadmoor, which gave him the opportunity to commit further crimes. In 1989, he started legal proceedings against newsgroup newspapers after the News of the World published an article in January 88 suggesting he had been in a position to secure the release of patients from Broadmoor who were considered dangerous. He won on 11th of July 1989. Newsgroup paid his legal costs and he received an apology from editors Kelvin McKenzie and Patsy Chapman. In 2012, it was reported that he had beep, 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 vulnerable patients at the hospitals. Yeah, and we know that's what he did. From 74 to 88, he was an honorary president of FAB, P-H-A-B, physically handicapped in the able-bodied community. He sponsored medical students performing undergraduate research in Leeds Uni Research Enterprise Scholarship Scheme, donating more than £60,000 every year. In 2010, the scheme was given a commitment of half a million over five years. Following his death, it was confirmed that a bequest had been made to allow continued support for the programme. He was a participant in marathons, many for PHAB, including its annual half marathon around Hyde Park, London. He cycled from Land's End to John O'Groats in 10 days for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution and ran in the Scottish People's Marathon. It was reported that he completed the London Marathon at the age of 79 
with rumours that he was driven round in a lead vehicle as an observer were denied by Marathon officials. He set up two charities, the Jimmy Savile Stoke Mandeville Hospital Trust in 1981 and Leeds-based Jimmy Savile Charitable Trust in 1984. During the scandal in October 2012, the charities announced that they would distribute their funds of 1.7 million and 3.7 million, respectively, among other charities, and then closed down. He also raised money for several Jewish charities. So, a master of the media, of TV, of radio, and at the top of the ladder in the charity world as well. They were three of the main focuses of his legitimate life. Now, let's look at his public image and friendships. So during his lifetime, and at the time of his death, he was regarded as an eccentric adornment to British public life, and a distinctive face on TV, who relished being in the public eye, and was a shrewd promoter of his own image. He cre created a bizarre yodel, and catch phrases including how's about that then and now then now then goodness gracious as it happens and guys and gals he was frequently spoofed for his dress sense which featured a tracksuit or a shell suit and gold jewelry a range of licensed fancy dress costumes was released with his consent in 2009 and he was often pictured holding a cigar he claimed to have started smoking cigars at the age of seven, saying, My dad gave me a dragon one at Christmas, thinking it would put me off them forever, but it had the opposite effect. Now, everyone that's researched Savile knows that he was a brainiac, he was a member of Mensa, high IQ, and also a member of the Institute of Advanced Motorists. He drove his Rolls Royce, he was, which we saw he utilized the Rolls Royce to get the girls in the back. He was made a life member of the British Gypsy Council in 1975, becoming the first outsider to be made a member. In 1984, he was accepted as a member of the an Ath Athenium in London, which is a gentleman's club in London's Pall Mall. I did go to an event there once. After being proposed by the Cardinal Basil Hume, he was chieftain of the Lockerba Highland Games for many years and owned a house in Glencoe. And there's, you can find the, the house in Glencoe on YouTube videos, it's been vandalized. I think some people even broke in and, and filmed in there. Savile's appearance on the final edition of Top of the Pops in 2006 was pre-recorded as it clashed with the games. Through his support of charities, he became a friend of Margaret Thatcher, who in 1981 described his work as marvellous. It is reported that Savile spent 11 consecutive New Year's Eves at Checkers with Margaret Thatcher and her family. They were like that. Wow. Although this has been disputed by Thatcher's daughter Carol and by Lord Bell, a close friend of the Thatcher family, who said, People make up such rubbish. Letters released in December 2012 by the National Archives under the 30-year rule confirm the close relationship between Savile and Thatcher. Some of the correspondence was heavily redacted. Ooh, I wonder why. Before publication, using exemptions under the Freedom of Information Act. So, we believe that Savile was brought into the royal family by Lord Mountbatten. Official story is Charles was interested in the mutual charity interests. His work with Stoke Mandeville Hospital made Savile a suitable figure to whom Charles could turn for advice on navigating Britain's health authorities. Charles met Savile multiple times in 1999. 
Charles visited Savile's Glencoe home for a private meal and sent him gifts on his 80th birthday and a note reading, Nobody will ever know what you have done for this country, Jimmy. This is to go some way in thanking you for that. Savile was in contact with other royals, received telegrams from Princess Diana, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, as well as a handwritten letter from Princess Alexandra's husband, Sir Angus Ogilvy, and a homemade card from Fergie. Savile acted as an advisor to Prince Charles, who sought his advice on how the royal family should interact with the public and the media. In 1989, Savile Hand wrote an unofficial set of guidelines to Charles on how members of the royal family and staff may respond to disasters. Charles showed the dossier to his father, Prince Philip, who passed the contents to Queen Elizabeth. A lifelong bachelor, Savile lived with his mother, the Duchess, and kept her bedroom and wardrobe exactly as it was when she died. Every year he had her clothes dry cleaned, and his personal relations were rarely the subject of media report or comment in his lifetime. And in episode two of The Reckoning, which goes out at nine tonight, I've seen it already. It's the one that's got my dad in it, so my dad's coming on at ten to do the response video tonight. It shows Savile kind of like fondling his mum's clothes after she's died and sniffing his mum's clothes. In his autobiography, he claimed he had many beep relations with women and that there have been trains and, with apologies to the hip parade, boats and planes. I am a member of the 40,000 foot club and bushes and fields, corridors, doorways, floors, chairs, slag heaps, desks, and probably everything except the celebrated chandelier and ironing board. Again, he had no qualms about boasting about his conquests. So it was on August 9th, 1997, he had a three hour quadruple heart bypass operation at Killingbeck Hospital in Leeds having known he had needed the surgery for at least four years after attending regular checkups. He arranged for a bench in Scarborough, North Yorkshire to be dedicated to his memory with a plaque saying, Jimmy Savile, but not just yet. It was the 29th of October 2011. Remember, he was born on Halloween. He almost died on Halloween. Just a couple of days before, he was found dead at his penthouse flat overlooking Round Hay Park in Leeds two days before his 85th birthday. He'd been in hospital with pneumonia and his death was considered not suspicious. His closed satin gold coffin was displayed at the Queen's Hotel in Leeds with the last cigar he smoked and his two This Is Your Life books. Around 4,000 people visited to pay tribute. The funeral was at Leeds Cathedral on 9th of November 2011 and he was buried at Woodlands Cemetery in Scarborough. As specified in his will, his coffin was inclined at the Masonic 45 degrees to fulfill his wish to see the sea and encased in concrete as a security measure. An auction of his possessions was conducted at the Royal Armouries Museum, Leeds, on 30th of July 2012, Proceeds going to charity. His silver Rolls Royce convertible was sold for 130000 to an internet bidder. License plate JS247 featured the original medium wave wavelength used by BBC Radio 1, which is 247 metres. And then after he died, all hell broke loose. We know that he came into contact with through his victims, through creative projects for the BBC, charity work at the NHS. Significant part of his career and public life involved working with kids, young people, vulnerable people, disabled people, visiting schools, visiting hospital wards. 
He spent 20 years from 64 presenting Top of the Pops, which was teenage audience targeted and an overlapping 20 years presenting Jim will fix it, in which he helped the wishes of viewers, mainly children, come true. So during his lifetime, there were police investigations. And as we've talked about on this channel many times, Savile had his weekly lunch meetings for the Leeds police. There was one person at the Leeds police in charge of receiving reports, complaints about him, whether they were launched around the UK. Those complaints never saw the light of day. None led to charges. The earliest known complaint was 1958. There was two reports. Each con um, concluded that there was insufficient evidence for any charges to be brought related to beep offences. Sporadic allegations were made against him dating back to 63, but only became widely publicised after his, after his death. His autobiography, As It Happens which was printed in uh, 74 and reprinted as Love is an Uphill Thing, 76, contains admissions of improper beep conduct, which appear to have passed unnoticed during his lifetime. Well, I'm going to have to get my hands on that, go over that, do an analysis of that. We know about Johnny Rotten, John Lydon. The first song I ever bought was... Um, Holidays in the Sun by the Sex Pistols. And Johnny Rotten, who went on to form Public Image also, alluded to the sordid conduct committed by Jimmy, as well as the suppression of widely held knowledge about his activity. In an October 1970 interview recorded for BBC Radio 1, Lydon stated, I'd like to beep J Jimmy Savile. I think he's a hypocrite. I bet he's into all kinds of seediness that we all know about, but are not allowed to talk about. I know some rumours. I bet none of this will be allowed out. As Johnny Rotten predicted, the comment was edited out by the BBC prior to broadcasting, but the complete interview was included as a bonus track on a pre-release of Public Image's 1978 debut album, public image first issue in 2013 after Savile's death. In October 2014, Johnny Rotten expanded on his original quote by saying, by killed, I meant locking him up and stopping him assaulting young children. I'm disgusted at the media pretending they weren't a war. Yeah, the media, absolute sickos, they're all in on it. The 1985 song, I Left My Heart in Papua General, by Half Man, Half Biscuit, alluded to improper behaviour by Savile. Get that small boy off your knee, was one of the lyrics. In 1987, Scottish stand-up comedian Jerry Sandowitz recorded a performance in Edinburgh in which he stated that Savile was the word for attracted to kids. The album Gobshite was withdrawn amid fears of legal action. Yes, Savile loved to sue people. In the 1990 interview for The Independent on Sunday, Lynn Barber asked Savile about rumours that he liked little girls. And Savile's reply was that, as he worked in the pop music business, quote, the young girls in question don't gather around me because of me. It's because I know the people they love, the stars, I am of no interest to them. In April 2000, in the Louis Theroux dock, when Louis met Jimmy, he acknowledged salacious tabloid people had raised rumours about whether he was a beep and said, I know I'm not. And the follow-up documentary, Louis Theroux Savile, about Savile and Theroux's inability to dig more deeply, heard on BBC Two in 2016, one of Theroux's more uncomfortable moments. In 2007, Savile was interviewed under caution by police investigating an allegation of indecent assault in the 1970s at the now-closed Duncraft-approved school for girls near Staines, Surrey, where he was a regular visitor. And I think it's Saturday night, the Savile Live on Saturday night 
we're going to be doing an analysis of the police interview with Sorry Police, and it's flabbergasting how he just takes control and the cops are kowtowing to him. Oh, Jimmy, it was all right. Should we call you Mr. Savile? Can we? It's, oh, it will disgust you. You will see how they just rolled over to the psychopath's charm and commanding aura. So, yeah, the Duncraft Approved School, which is close to where I am based in Guildford, it's in Stain, Surrey, where Savile was a regular visitor. In October 2009, the Crown Prosecution Service advised there was insufficient evidence to take any further action and no charges were brought. So it was the Duncraft girls getting online and discussing this stuff that got the attention of the media and the cops and set things in motion for after he died. In March 2008, Savile started legal proceedings against the Sun, which had linked him in several articles to child beep at the Jersey children's home, Haute de la Garenne. At first, he denied visiting the home, but later admitted he had done so following the publication of a photograph showing him at the home surrounded by kids. And that's why, you know, he couldn't have got away with a lot of this stuff in the internet era. The state of Jersey police said that in 2008, an allegation of an indecent beep by Savile at the home in the 1970s had been investigated, but there had been insufficient evidence to proceed. Yet again, we see this over and over again. In a 2009 interview with his biographer, Savile defended the views of people who are into child videos, let's just put it that way, including the pop star and convicted... Beep! Offender, Gary Glitter. Savile argued that viewers, quote, didn't do anything wrong, but they are then demonised. He said Glitter was a celebrity being unfairly vilified for watching dodgy films in the privacy of his home. Absolutely sickening. Savile went on to say that Gary has not tried to sell him, not tried to show him in the public or anything like that. It were for his own gratification, whether it was right or wrong, of course, it's up to him as a person. Trying to justify those kind, the viewers of those kind of videos. This is, and he's and he's telling this to his biographer. The interview was not published at the time, and the recording was not released until after he died. Wow. In 2012, Sir Roger Jones, former BBC Governor for Wales and Chairman of BBC Charity Children Need disclosed that more than a decade before Jimmy's death, he had banned the very strange and creepy Savile from involvement in the charity. Former Royal Family Press Secretary Dickie Arbiter said Savile's behaviour had raised concern and suspicion when Savile acted as an informal marriage counsellor between Charles and Diana in the late 80s. Although no reports had been made, Arbiter added that during his regular visits to Charles' office at St. James Palace, Savile would do the rounds of the young ladies taking their hands and rubbing his lips all the way up their arms. He was relentless. Wow. So it was after his death, it just went ballistic. BBC Newsnight program began an investigation to reports that he was a beep abuser. Marion Jones and Liz McKean interviewed an alleged survivor on camera and others agreed to have their stories told. The interviewee's alleged abuse at Duncroft approved school for girls in Staines, Stoke Mandeville Hospital and the BBC. Newsnight discovered that Surrey police had investigated allegations against Savile the item was scheduled for broadcast in Newsnight, 7th of December 2011, but was withdrawn before broadcast over Christmas 2011 as the BBC broadcast two tributes to Savile. And these complaints went from Surrey Police to Leeds Police, and Leeds Police, he had them in his pocket. The flow of information, he had it ready to be guillotined, canned. In December 2012, a review 
led by Nick Pollard of the BBC's handling of the issue, described the decision not to broadcast the Newsnight investigation as flawed. The review said that Jones and McKean had found cogent evidence that Savile was a beep. George Entwistle, at that time the director of BBC Vision, had been told about the plan to broadcast the Newsnight item was described by the review as unnecessarily cautious and an opportunity was lost. There was no public mention of the Newsnight investigation into Savile in December 2011, but in early 2012, several newspapers reported the BBC had investigated, but not broadcast its report of allegations of beep immediately after his death. The oldie alleged there had been a cover-up by the BBC. Of course, there was a cover-up. These media organisations cover everything up. They want to squeeze every last penny out of the star performers. And they cover this stuff, stuff up for as long as they can get away with it. And then when it comes out, they pretend that they didn't know. How many times have we seen this formula applied? On 28th of September 2012, almost a year after his death, ITV said it would broadcast a documentary as part of its exposure series, The Other Side of Jimmy Savile, presented by Mark Williams Thomas. So Mark Williams Thomas features in our Savile documentary, Untouchable, and you can also see a separate Savile interview with Mark Williams Thomas on the channel, if you want to check that one out. I think the link is at the top of the description box. Thomas was a consultant on the original Newsnight investigation, revealed claims by up to 10 women, including one age under 14 at the time, that they had been beep or R-worded by Savile during the 60s and 70s. This announcement attracted national attention, and more reports and claims of beep against him accumulated. The documentary went out 3rd of October the next day, the Met... London cops said the Child Beep Investigation Command would assess the allegations. The scandal led to inquiries into practices at the BBC. How many times have we heard this? And the National Health Service, it was alleged that rumours of his activities had circulated at the BBC in the 60s and 70s, but no action had been taken. The Director General of the Beeb, George Entwistle, apologised for what had happened and on 16th of October 2012 appointed former High Court Judge Dame Janet Smith to review the culture and practices of the BBC during the time Savile worked there. And Nick Pollard, former Sky News exec, was appointed to look at why the Newsnight investigation into Savile's activities was dropped shortly before transmission in December 2011. By 19th of October 2012, police were pursuing 400 lines of inquiry based on testimony from 200 witnesses via 14 police forces across the UK. This came in on an unprecedented scale with the number of potential survivors staggering. Investigations codenamed Operation Utree were opened to identify criminal conduct related to his activities by the Met Police and to review the 2009 decision by the CPS to drop a prosecution as unlikely to succeed. Yeah, those people needed to be held accountable. By 25th of October, the police reported the number of possible survivors approaching 300. Wow. On 22nd of October 2012, Panorama broadcast an investigation into Newsnight and found evidence suggesting senior manager pressure. On the same day, Newsnight editor Peter Rippon stepped down with immediate effect. The Department of Health appointed former barrister Kate Lompard to chair and oversee its investigations into Savile's activities at Stoke Mandeville, Leeds General Infirmary Broadmoor, and other hospitals and facilities across the UK. And then on 12th of November 2012, the Met announced the scale of allegations reported Savile. It was off the scale in Britain, a total of 450 
alleged victims had contacted the cops in 10 weeks since the investigation was launched. Officers recorded 199 crimes in 17 police force areas in which Savile was a suspect, 31 allegations of our word in seven areas. Analysis of the report showed 82% of those who came forward were female, 80% were children or young people at the time of the incidents. A former Broadmoor nurse claimed that Savile had said he had engaged in acts with the deceased in the Leeds General Infirmary mortuary where Savile was friends with the chief mortician who gave him unrestricted access to the deceased. Wow. Wow. Exposure update. The Jimmy Savile investigation was shown on ITV 21st of November 2012. In March 2013, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary reported that 214 of the complaints made against him after his death would have been criminal offences if reported at the time. 16 were R-worded by him when they were under 16 and 4 had been under the age of 10. 13 others reported serious assaults by Savile, 4 under the age of 10. Disgusting. Another 10 reported our word by Savile after the age of 16. Whew, this is making me feel sick. I'm just going to have to open the window one second to let some fresh air in. <clears throat> Whew, what an absolute monster. In January 2013, a joint report by the NSPC and the Met giving victims a voice stated that 450 people had made complaints with a record period of abuse stretching from 1955 to 2009. Oh my God, that's almost 60 years he got away with it. Almost 60 years? And the ages of the complainants at the time of the incidents ranging from 8 to 47 The victims included 28 kids aged under 10, including 10 boys aged 8. Wow. A further 63 were girls aged between 13 and 16. And nearly three quarters were under 18. 214 criminal offences were recorded. 34 had been R-worded. Um, with reports across 28 police forces. How does this happen for so long? Wow. Former professional wrestler Adrian Street described in November 2013 interview how Savile used to go on and on about the young girls who'd wait in line for him outside his dressing room. He'd pick the ones he wanted and say to the rest, unlucky, Come back again tomorrow night. He cultivated a tough guy image promoted by his entourage, was, but was hit with real blows during a 1971 bout with Street, who commented that he had, had he known the full extent of what I know about Savile, he would have given him an even bigger hiding. During the independent inquiry into ch child beep abuse, in March 2019, it was reported that Robert Armstrong, the head of the Honours Committee, had resisted attempts by Margaret Thatcher to award Savile a knighthood in the 1980s due to concerns about his private life. Oh, but Maggie Thatcher steamrolled over that. An anonymous letter received by the committee in 1998 said the report of a beep nature could emerge about Savile. 
Yeah, they were trying to play the waiting game with him for this award. But Thatcher steamrolled the objections and guaranteed Jimmy he would get his knighthood. In 2022, former BBC presenter Mark Lawson wrote about his encounters with Savile and hearing from many BBC personnel about his abuse and rumoured activities with deceased. Lawson ended, The true story is his victims and how the BBC, Department of Health, Conservative Party, Catholic Church, police forces, local councils and libel laws let them down. A monster for whom the British establishment, political, royal, broadcasting, ecclesiastical, medical, charitable, provided a dazzling shield. Wow. An authorised biographer How's about that then by Alison Bellamy was published in June 2012. After the claims made against him were published, the author said that in the light of the allegations, she felt let down and betrayed by Savile. Within a month of the child beep scandal emerging, many places and organisations named after or connected to Savile were renamed or had his name removed. A memorial plaque on the wall of his former home in Scarborough was removed in early October 2012 after it was defaced with graffiti. A wooden statue of Savile at Scoutston Leisure Centre in Glasgow was removed around the same time. Signs on a football path in Scarborough named Savile's View were removed. Savile's Hall, the conference centre at the Royal Armouries Museum in Leeds was renamed New Dock Hall. The Savile Charitable Trust and the Savile Stoke Mandeville Hospital Trust founded in his name to fight poverty and sickness and other charitable purposes, announced they were too closely tied to his name to be sustainable and would close and distribute their funds to other charities so as to avoid harm to beneficiaries from future media attention. On 9th of October 2012, relatives said the headstone of his grave would be removed, destroyed and sent to landfill. The Savile family expressed their sorrow for the anguish of the victims and respect for public opinion. His body is interred in the cemetery in Scarborough, although it has been proposed that it be exhumed and cremated. On 28th of October, it was reported that his cottage in Glencoe had been vandalised with spray paint and the door damaged. The cottage was sold in May 2013. In 2012, Richard Harrison, long-serving psychiatric nurse at Broadmoor Hospital, said Savile had been regarded by staff as a man with a severe personality disorder and a liking for kids. Another nurse, Bob Allen, considered Savile to be a psychopath, stating a lot of the staff said he should be behind bars. Allen also said that he had once reported Savile to his supervisor for apparent improper conduct with a juvenile, but no action was taken. Psychologists in The Guardian and The Herald argued that Savile exhibited the dark triad of personality traits, narcissism, Machiavellianism and psychopathy. His estate worth about four million was frozen by its executors NatWest Bank in view of the possibility that those making allegations could make claims for damages. After a range of expenses were charged to the estate, a remainder of about 3.3 million was made available to compensate victims. Those victims not having a claim against another entity such as the BBC or the NHS being given priority and all victims limited to a maximum claim of £60,000, about $70,000, against all entities combined. The compensation scheme was approved in the late 2014 by the courts. Most of his honours were rescinded following the claims. Knighthood expires when the holder dies, so it cannot be posthumously revoked. Episodes of Top of the Pops hosted by him are not being shown. On 26th of June 2014, Secretary of State for Health Jeremy Hunt delivered a public apology in the House of Commons 
to the patients of the National Health Service abused by Savile, confirming that complaints had been raised before 2012 but were ignored by the bureaucrats. And here's the quote. Savile was a callous, opportunistic, wicked predator who abused and R-worded individuals, many of them patients and young people who expected and had a right to expect to be safe. His actions spanned five decades from the 60s to 2010. As a nation at that time, we held Savile in our affection as a somewhat eccentric national treasure with a strong commitment to charitable causes. Today's report shows that in reality he was a sickening and prolific beep beep who repeatedly exploited the trust of a nation for his own vile purposes. So, his honours and awards. And how Masonic is this? In the 1972 New Year honours, he got Officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, entitled to append OBE to his name. In the 1990 Queen's Birthday Honours, he was made a Knight Bachelor for Charitable Services, entitled to use the honorific prefix Sir. Prime Minister Maggie Thatcher made four attempts to have him knighted before succeeding in her final year in office. Following the allegations of Beep, Prime Minister David Cameron suggested in October 2012 that it would be possible for Savile's honours to be rescinded by the Honours Forfeiture Committee. A cabinet office spokesman said there was no procedure to posthumously revoke an OB or knighthood as these honours automatically expire when a person dies, but that the committee might consider introducing a process just to do so because of Savile's case. He was honoured with a papal knighthood. He was made a knight commander of the Pontifical Equestrian Order of St. Gregory the Great by Pope John II in 1990. After the scandal broke, the Catholic Church in England and Wales asked the Holy See to consider stripping Savile of the honour. In October 2012, Father Federico Lombardi told the BBC News, The Holy See firmly condemns the horrible crimes of beep beep of minors. Well, that's the, the pot calling the kettle black, isn't it? And the honour in the light of recent information, should certainly not have been bestowed, as there does not exist any permanent official list of persons who have received papal honours in the past. It is not possible to strike anyone off a list that does not exist. How about that for double speak, saying we're not going to take the honour back? The names of recipients of papal honours do not appear in the pontifical yearbook and the honour expires with the death of the individual. Savile was an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Radiologists, and he also had the Cross of Merit of the Order Pro Merito Melitensi. We need to get one of our guys on here who's an expert in symbology and secret societies to discuss this in further depth. Put one in the chat if you would like to see that. Put a two in the chat if we... Should not go there. So, we've withdrawn honours. Like we said, many get withdrawn on the death. In the 1970s, he was awarded an honorary Green Beret by the Royal Marines for completing the Royal, thanks for the ones, Royal Marine Commando Speed March, 30 miles across Dartmoor, carrying 30 pounds, 14 kg. Following the allegations, the Beret Award was not revoked. That was another one that expires on death. He was awarded an honorary doctorate of law by the University of Leeds, revoked in 2012. Honorary doctorate from the University of Bedfordshire, 2009, posthumously rescinded, 2012. He was made a free man of the borough of Scarborough in 20, 2005, removed in 2012. All right, that is a basic summary of his life. There's so much more to it. We've got five podcasts coming out this week of Savile content, interviews with experts, Wedger, Christian Walmer, Boris, Christopher Berry D. We're not doing AU tomorrow. 
I think we're going to rerun the Atwood Unleashed documentary, Untouchable, the four-hour one about Savile. That's the last I've heard. Thursday night, I think we've got a royal mess. Um, I'm sorry, uh, John Wedger with um, Crime Theory series. Friday night, a royal mess is now back to Friday night. But I'm back at 10 o'clock tonight with my dad, Derek Atwood, who was in episode two of The Reckoning. If you've watched it already on iPlayer, let me know if you've spotted him in there. If you've got any questions for my dad about being involved in The Reckoning, please have them ready for 10 o'clock tonight. Much love and respect, you guys. I can hear little Ziggy in the background uh, making some demands on Jen, and it sounds like she needs my help right now. Hope to see some of you guys at 10. Thanks for joining us.